doing today? Everybody is awake and, and you're ready to receive the word today? Okay. How many of you remember that last week we finished, um, we're, we're in this all things new. We have been since the beginning of the year because God has given us a new beginning here at First Church. And so we began talking about all the new beginnings that God wants us to have. And he wants us to be um, vibrant and active and alive in our relationship with him. And before we can close out our um, discussion on all things new, on sharing your faith, I do need to bring to your attention a few things on the back tables. Um, there are going to be some uh, new connect groups. We're calling them connect groups because we're connecting with God and we're connecting with each other in a small group environment. Some of these groups will take place right here at church. Others are going to be taking place in host homes, and they're going to be facilitated there. And um, one group may start in this area of town, and when they're done, it may go again in another area of town. So you're not going to be able to miss anything. You're going to be able to connect with a connect group somewhere. And that is the whole idea, because that's how we grow more intimate with God and intimate with each other is when we spend time with one another. So I want to draw your attention um, to a couple of things. Um, we just received material for Christianity, cults, and religions. We're going to have a class on um, Com knowing what it is Christianity believes, what we believe in our basic doctrine, and then those of other modern-day cults um, and other religions in the world. And so there's a sign-up sheet right there on that back table, and I want you to be aware of that and go back and sign up for that. It's probably going to be scheduled within the next month. And uh, the next one, we don't have the curriculum let it yet. It should be here this week. It's called tell someone. And it is about how to share your faith confidently. That is going to be a six-week um, program. It's going to probably be in a host home. There's a little DVD clip that you're going to be watching, and you're going to have an opportunity to know how to tell your story more, with confidence and how it's, it's not as hard as you think it is. It is not for paid preachers and staff peoples of church to do it. God's choosing you because you have a story. You have a story to tell. And he's using you in relationship to go tell somebody about Jesus. There's a sign-up sheet back there as well. And then Ron Ferns. Where's Ron Ferns? Raise your hand in the back row over there. Ron Ferns, the kite master, is going to be by the kites, and one of them's falling off the wall right now. But there's a sign-up sheet for you to be um, a helper on that day. We had so many people in the South X one year. We were exhausted from building kites. He will show you how to build a kite and help someone else build a kite. But we need many people to be able to do that. That is going to be at the end of March. Look in your bulletin. It's in the schedule. But he has a sign-up sheet back there. He's going to be standing back there at that sign-up sheet, and he needs your help. Can you come and give three hours on a Saturday to build a relationship with someone over building a kite? It's as simple as that, okay? And then I want to tell you that Miss Alice is going to be back there as well. Ron, we hung your kites up there, and they're falling off the walls. So go back by where the kites are, and, and you'll, meet, you'll meet Ron back there. Next to him is going to be Miss Alice, and she's going to have something for you. She's going to come up later in the hour after the message to tell you what it is, because we are on the cusp of our Lent season. Lent is not tip, typically something we do in the Church of the Nazarene, but there's so much good things that we can glean from it. We want to teach you what that is, and we want to give you an opportunity to read a 40-day read with the entire church. It gives us opportunity to read and pray for the different things around the world that we need to be enveloped in. It's a little bit of missions and Lent season put together. So that's going to be back there as well. 
One other thing, you can see three tables back there with the library of Pastor Les's prized possessions, his books. And um, they're back there for you to take. They are all free. We want to get them into your hands in order for you to read and enrich your own spirit and your own spiritual walk. And when you're done reading it, pass it on to somebody else so that they can grow in their spiritual walk as well. Let's keep that alive and well. Let's keep it just circulating. When w those tables will be here for a couple of weeks, what is not taken will be de de um, donated to a used book place. So I really want you to take a look at what you might want to take from Pastor Les's collection, and we're grateful to be able to put those out. Thank you, Susan, for letting us do that. Now, today... I am going to give you an opportunity right now to either stay right where you're at or to leave the sanctuary. Oh, why is she doing that? Because today we're going to talk about money. And I want you to know that right up front. We don't do that a lot, but we, we need to hear what the Lord has to say about money. So I'm going to give you an opportunity right now right now, to get up and leave if you don't want to hear about money. Okay, time's up. Time's up. Um, but I do want to tell you, because that turns some people off, okay? I don't, you don't need to hear what I have to say about money. You don't have to hear, and I don't want you to hear what Marcia thinks about giving, because it doesn't matter what I think. But I think we all need to hear, what does God's word say about money, finances, and giving? We need to have a basic foundation as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. What does God say about giving? What does God say about money? Because we got a lot of misconceptions out there. Even as believers, we have misconceptions about it. Now, this week, we're going to be talking about this in two different elements here. We are going to be talking this week about four fundamental basic building blocks of what the scripture says about finances. We're going to build upon those. Next week, we are going to talk about how we put feet to what we've learned this week. How do we practice this? What do we do with this? What do we do with this? I had um, a wonderful privilege. My, our kids have grown up um, with us giving tithes and offerings. All of, our, um, all of our lives that our kids have been around. It was just really instilled on us. There were times when money was extremely tight in our family, and I mean, I had to budget buying a stamp. My mother-in-law didn't get, get a lot of pictures because at that time, I'm talking 30, 35 years ago, um, I didn't have the 25 cents to go and develop camera photos to send her. I didn't have, we didn't have that kind of money. Money was extremely tight. And so um, we had, we had as young believers, when our family was born, is when we really established our involvement and commitment to a local church body. And that's when we started tithing. We have not stopped tithing. If we've had an increase in our tithing, in our income, we have increased our tithe. If my husband has had several other jobs, he's teaching elsewhere, we include that in our tithe. Anything coming in is what we tithe on. We're going to explain all of that this week and next week. But there's a few building blocks that we need to fully understand before we can even begin thinking about giving to church. These are, these are just some, these are the cinder blocks of building the building. Okay? So, the very first thing is, what does the Bible say? Number one, out of these four foundational things, write some things down. I encourage you, pull out your sermon notes. Write down what's important to you. You don't want to miss this because these are God's words. You don't have to like me for saying it, but it's God's words. Can I hear an amen on that? You don't have to like me. You can get mad at me for talking about money. But I want you to talk to God about it. These are basic things because he wants to bless you. Okay? So the very first thing is God owns everything. Write it down. 
the natural way that we look at material possessions and even our own lives is that we think it belongs to us. Well, it's my life. I can do with what I want to with it. It's my money. I can do with it what I want to do with it. That's our normal. That's our default. We think about everything being ours. What comes into my bank account is mine. What comes into my home is mine. What comes in is mine. That's the way the world wants us to think. And the first biblical truth about stewardship, I'm going to explain what that is in a minute, it stands in total contrast to our human default thinking. And it's this. Everything. God is the owner of everything. Everything. Okay? Let's look at some scripture here. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Your arm is endowed with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand is exalted. That speaks directly to God affirming that he's the owner of the heavens and the earth. He's the owner of the heavens and the earth. He created the world and everything in it. He is powerful and exalted. He is in control of the entire universe and the very forces of nature. Somebody once said to me, um, we were talking, we had a conversation about uh, creation and how creation happened. And, you know, I mean, the Bible lays out um, that it was created in six days, and you can look at that literally, or you can't look at that literally, or you can think that, you know, when he made light, that maybe that was an explosion. You can think all sorts of things. But this one person who had been, a, who is a believer for a long time said, you know, I look, at, I look at it this way because he was a real science guy. And he said um, that, you know, when I look at creation, I'm going to go to science to support anything. And I said, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't you really want to go to the God who created science? He created science. He created the natural properties. He created science. Don't you want to go to him? This has got to be our be-all, end-all. Right here. Science will prove it, but it's right here. It begins right here and it ends right here. Science will support it. We have to understand that. Okay? Now, number two, truth number two. Write these down. We are managers or stewards of God's resources. Another word for steward is to be a manager. A manager. In the very first chapter of the Bible, the book of Genesis, immediately after the creation of the human race, the Bible affirms that human beings were created to manage Earth's resources. Here are the words that God says. And of course, the people that he's talking about are Adam and Eve says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in numbers. Number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Rule this earth. That gave full authority to Adam and Eve to be the caretakers of what God created. Are you getting that? Are you getting that? Okay, I need you to be more vocal with me. God is the owner of all that he created. Human beings, you and me, Adam and Eve, are the administrators, the stewards, the managers, however you want to word that, of God's creation. This includes our money, our material properties, our family, our time, our own bodies, animals of the earth, the whole earth. We are managers, administrators, or stewards. Even, even our work ethic. We are to be a good manager of that. 
We need to keep that in check. So let's define stewardship. According to Ron Blue, he's a Christian financial advisor. He said this, read this with me. Stewardship is the use of God-given resources for the accomplishment of God-given goals. Okay, so stewardship, managing, managing God's resources, it's the use of God-given resources, whatever it is, for the accomplishment of God-given goals. He set the goals. The first one is this, seek and save the lost and make disciples. That's what we ought to be concerned with. So whatever resources we have, we need to pool them and use them for that end. That's what managing that's what biblical stewardship is. The use of God-given resources for the accomplishment of God-given goals. So we need to be thinking the way God thinks, not the way we think. Because remember, our default is hoarding it for ourselves. Another kite just fell down. Okay, now, many of you also know who John Wesley is. But let me tell you, I want to explain for those who don't know. John Wesley was an English, English preacher he was a theologian, and he was an evangelist. He went out and proclaimed Jesus Christ was the way to be saved. He was the leader of a revival movement in the Church of England in the 1700s, and it's known as Methodism, the, church, the uh, Methodist Church. He is, uh, um, he's the one that kind of broke down the most uh, effective way to learn the Word of God and grow disciples is in small groups. He had a method. That's why they call it Methodism, M the Methodist Church. We, the Church of the Nazarene, our roots come from John Wesley and the Wesleyan theology. Um, he said this, though. I love this. When the possessor of heaven, that would be God, brought you into being and placed you in this world, he placed you here not as an owner, but as a steward, as a manager, one who cares for the resources of God. Whether you realize it or not, whether you recognize it or not, nothing you have, nothing you own, nothing you have your name on really belongs to you. Can I hear an amen? Not your house, not your car, not your children, not your bank account, not your clothes. Nothing belongs to you. Why? Because it all belongs to him. It belongs to him. We have to get this in here and here. This needs to be the core thing that we take away from today. Everything that we have belongs to God. It says here, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That comes from Psalms. And then the Bible also says, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. You see, he not only owns the cattle, he owns the hills. Are we getting this? This is foundational. This is the first brick. God owns everything everything, the skin that wraps your muscles. He owns it all. How are we doing on being a good steward of it? He owns everything. And one of the most beautiful characteristics of our Father God is that he doesn't hoard anything. He doesn't keep it to himself. God is a giver, and he is a very generous giver. Anything and everything that we have are gifts of grace from him. We cannot possibly earn them. We cannot possibly buy them. They are gifts given to us. Now, I want you to get your pens ready because I'm going to list a few things here, and there's scripture that supports that. So write as it's put up here, because these are some basic things that he gives us. He gives us the Sabbath. A day where we get to gather together and worship his name as one body. He gives us the Sabbath, Exodus 16, 29. He gives us safety. And I want you to read these scriptures when you get home. Did you know that he gives you safety? 
Deuteronomy 12.10. He gives us showers and rain. And I don't know about you, but I am so grateful. Yes, we've had days and days and days of rain. We've had a little bit of leakage in the lower level. Not much, because the team is on it here. Um, but anyway, I'm grateful for puddles, and I'm grateful for the creek swelling up, and I'm grateful that there's snow in the mountains, because you know what? That means we're going to have some water next August. I'm grateful for these things, and our farmers are going to have water for their crops. That's their livelihood. God is being gracious to us. Showers and rain come from Job 5.10. Security. We have security in God. Job 24, 23. We have a calm quiet. We have this blessed assurance, this calm quiet, no matter what's going on around us. We can be so secure in God that we don't have to be uh, moved by what's going on around us, the trouble that's going on around us. We have provision. Job 36, 31. We have sleep. Psalm 127, 2. We have strength, Isaiah 40, 29. We have wisdom from Daniel 2, 21. We have the scriptures. Every one of us has a copy of the word of God. And if you don't, we've got free copies at the tables for you. Take one. There's some back here as well. Take the word. It's given to us. It is the very breath of God himself giving us instructions. And we have salvation from Psalm 62, 1 and 2. Did you notice that several of these, these um, were from the book of Job? And we all know that Job, everything that he had except his life was taken from him. Everything. His health, his children, his home, his cattle, his livelihood, everything was taken. And yet he says this, I have provision, I have security, I have salvation. Now, Paul, I'm going to jump into the New Testament here. Paul was in Athens waiting for some of the other believers to come and join him. And it's recorded that he says this. I, this is very important. This comes from, I want you to write this scripture down. Acts chapter 17. Listen to this. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So what he's trying to do is they had an altar set up to an unknown God. They were worshiping an unknown God. They didn't know why. And Paul's saying, let me tell you who this unknown God is. Then he says this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. That comes from Psalm 17, 24 and 25. Look that up in your own Bibles today. We can't even take a breath for granted because it came from God said this many times, take a deep breath. <sighs> that was a gift from God. He gives and he expects us, you and me, to be good stewards and managers over the gifts that he has given us. He expects that. Now, we're going to move on to the third truth. The third truth is this. We are accountable to God. Some of us don't like that word. Kids don't like that word when parents use it. You're accountable to me. We are accountable to God. 
I want you to follow along. The, the words are going to be up here, but I am going to read you a scripture. And I want you to follow along, and I want you to get the gist of this. This is the parable of the talents. Now, the New Testament uses the word gold for the word talents. But we, many of us church people that have been in the church for some time, know it as the parable of the talents. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. He did nothing with it to benefit his master. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and I gather where I have not gathered scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it, um, it back with interest. He would have gotten a little something from his bag of gold. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not a very good in outcome for that one. You see, we will all be accountable to the master Jesus Christ, for what we did on this earth with the choices that we've made, whether it be with money, our bodies, our family, our spouses, and our choices, how we do at work, we are going to be held accountable to Father God for that one day. We will stand alone and need to give an account. I'm not guilting anybody. I'm just telling you what happened to this man. And I'm reminding you we are all responsible and accountable. In this case, now, now, this is talking about money here, the talents, the bags of gold. Many times, and I've heard this preached, and I'll probably preach on it down the road, this can also be referred to souls. If you have been given by grace the gift of salvation, Jesus is also asking you, are you sharing that with anybody? Are you helping to save other people's souls by how God has touched your life? What are you doing with that? Because I'm going to hold you accountable for that. That's what he's saying. 
Here in particular, he's talking about money. On another occasion, Jesus said this. Let's read this. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. I found that to be true in our own life when we were young in the Lord and we began giving. As a matter of fact, even back when I was little and, um, and I, the, I was brought up in the Lutheran church and the, um, the gold plate was passed and people would put in money. And if it wasn't in an envelope or if it wasn't in a check, you got to see what kind of money was put in there. And when I saw that somebody put in a folded $5 bill, I thought, oh, they've got to be so rich. You know, and I thought that was a really, really big deal. I'm not asking you, don't be looking at the plate at what other people are given. Use the envelopes that are in the back of the, the pockets of the chair. But um, what I'm saying is when you, what you give is going to be given back to you. We are going to touch on that scripture next week. And it is all based upon the condition of your own heart. This is all based on your own heart and your own walk. And really where you're at in being totally surrendered and trusting of God. Okay? Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. God will entrust more resources to us if we show our faithfulness with the small amounts that he's giving us right now. We have seen that and we can validate that in our own lives. We are accountable to him for the wise and effective use of our material resources and the time that we live on this earth. We are accountable for that. The simple awareness of this accountability should move us to rethink and our use of resources here on this earth. We, we might need to change the way we think and, and let God reshape how we think money to be. I had a wonderful conversation with my son, Joel, who um, is involved in the church. He's born again. His family is going to church and all of that. And I asked him the other day, I said, because I was studying this, I said, Joel, just be sure that you're tithing. And it just opened up the door to conversation. You want a conversation at your dinner table? Talk about tithing. Talk about money. And it just opened a wonderful, open discussion. He asked questions, and we were both pondering, you know, and I was, I was in the beginning of my study. So um, I said, you know, let me, let me get a little bit further down. And he wants a copy of my of my lesson here, you know, and he wants to be grounded. He's 20, he just turned 30 this year. And so he's young, he's a millennialist, okay? And he's, he's beginning to, you know, give back to the church and consider these scripture, scriptural principles of what God is requiring. And then he went, uh, he had uh, to go home for lunch and he came back and we sat down and talked about it some more. It was a wonderful thing because it was a very open discussion about something very serious that God wants us to grasp. He wants to grasp this. My prayer, church, is that we grasp this. We grasp this. Because we need to be thinking about the kingdom here. And God has some powerful things for this church to do right here. We are accountable to him for the wise and effective use of the material resources and the time that we have and we live on this earth. And the simple awareness of this is that we will begin to think differently about our giving and our tithing, okay? Many of us don't let God into this area of our life. We feel that if we make the money, that we should be able to control where we say it goes. Next week, we are going to put real practical feet to all of this. Okay, so what I want us to end up with is this. He is the one that allows you to have your job. He is the one that allows you to draw on your retirement or your social security. He is the one that allows you to receive disability benefits. He is the one. He is the one. And we need to give back to him what rightfully belongs to him. 
Thank you for that. Amen. You see, God's letting his light shine. He wants to shine his light and reveal things in us that we don't let him into those nooks and crannies and, and crevices of our life. They're, we leave those just for us. Sometimes we don't even talk to our spouse about it. Okay? But God's saying, let me shine my light on that because I want all of you. Because I gave you my all. He, it, his light exposes anything that controls us if we let him. The question is, are we going to let him shine that bright light inside those areas, in the, inside those things in us that we keep really hidden and dark? We don't want God in there to see my checkbook. I don't want him to see how much money I spend on eating out. I don't want him to see how much money I spend on clothes. I don't want to recognize it. But it will tell us what, what controls us. And if that's controlling us, then there's a portion that we're not allowing God to control. You can say amen if you want to. A scripture from Matthew says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermins do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Is it in the power and control of money here on this earth? Or is it on heaven and bringing in as many souls as possible with you when you get there? That needs to be our drive. Do you love and trust and worship God enough that you will be a faithful manager of what he has given you? Allow God to examine you. Just allow him. One of the things we're going to do this afternoon, we have a written budget. And we're going, we're going to go over it together. I have it typed up in my computer, but he knows everything that goes out. And we're just going to go over that. We typically do that every month. So that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing with our pooled resources. And right in there on its own line item is First Church of the Nazarene and anything that we want to give offering to. And we're going to talk about that next week so that you too can have a plan. Allow God to examine all of those areas of, her, of your life. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Can I hear an amen? You cannot serve both. So what's going to control you? What are you going to serve? Okay, the final truth. Effective stewardship is a learned skill. It's a learned skill. I talked uh, a little bit about this. We need to be taught how to be a good steward, how to be a good manager of God's resources to us. We tend to be hoarders and keep things to ourselves, things that we've worked so hard for keeping it for our own use, to the point that when we see some needy people, we don't want to give them money, and we're thinking in our mind, they need to get out there and work. I know it because I've thought of that myself. Some people aren't able to do that. Some people need help. And if the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit, is convicting your heart, Reach in there and get that dollar bill. Get your coins that are saved in your console right there. Give them a handful. When you give that, you do not have, you do not have the authority to tell them what to do with it because you're letting go of it. Amen? You have no right to tell someone else how to spend their money. You let God do that. But when you give and you let that coin go from your hand into theirs, it's no longer in yours. It doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to them and they're accountable for it. But you've done what you've sensed the Lord wanted you to do. Amen? Amen. So, we are hoarders and we tend to keep things for ourselves. 
Paul instructs Timothy, the one he was mentoring, he was a young pastor, and he was teaching him. He says, teach about faithful stewardship of resources. He says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. That means the life that Jesus gives us, not tethered to control of money. Free from that. Free to be the generous givers that God showed us when he gave Jesus. Free. It gives us a sense of freedom. I always keep money in my console, paper money and coins, whatever's left over. And I, I just put it in there because as the Lord puts it on my heart and I can roll my window down and give somebody some, some coins without holding up traffic, bang, I'm ready to do that. It might mean a meal for them today. It might mean the only meal for them today. You don't know. You don't know. But now is a really good time to identify the difference between wants and needs. Wants and needs. We get these screwed up all the time. A want is to have a strong desire for something. A st I want that. I want that. I would really like that. I don't need it to live, but I really want that. A need is to require something as necessary or essential. All human beings need air. All human beings need food. All human beings need clothing. All human beings do need some sort of shelter. Even homeless people have, um, have tarps or some kind of cardboard or something to shelter them. We all need those kinds of things. But we need to distinguish the difference between the two. God promises to meet all of our needs. And we get this messed up so much. I need this. I need that. But many times we mix it up and we feel um, that our, our need is really what we want. Okay? I need clothes to wear. I want designer clothes. I don't need designer clothes. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? I need a yes or a no. Okay, okay. We need to be careful there. It says here in Philippians 4.19, many of you know this, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. If you want to know whether something's a want or a need, ask him. He'll help you identify that if you're listening. God knows that we have basic survival needs on this earth, and we need to pray for the wisdom to be good stewards in order to meet those basic needs. He will give us the wisdom, but we also need wisdom to say no to some things. We need wisdom to be able to say no to some things. It's really... It really goes, gets under my skin when I see parents giving their little children everything that they want. They know how to whine and they know how to play parent against parent. Yes, okay, we need to be really careful. If you really love your child, you need to be able to let your yes be yes and your no be no. And be strong, be assertive with that. If you say it, then you need to follow through with it. But your kids don't need everything that you give them. You know, teach them value. And you don't do that by giving them everything. Is that right? Okay, okay. Um, and we play a very vital role here. We need to, if we know the difference between a want and a need, we need to be able to follow that through because our vital role is to heed that wisdom that God is giving us. I don't need that. I don't need that right now. 
And maybe the Lord is just saying, but next month you're going to need uh, work on your car because I know that you're going to need something. You don't, but he does. You know what I'm saying? We need to listen to that, okay? Now, I'm going to close out by saying this. Our newly elected board is going to have a retreat this next weekend, this next Saturday. It's an all-day thing. We're going to be discussing and making prayerful decisions on behalf of this church to do the following. To live as faithful stewards, setting the example for our next generation, setting the example for the next year that we are governing this church body. We are going to be examples, and we need your prayer to do that. The second thing is we are going to teach stewardship the managing of God's resources that are given to us to help others and to help others be faithful administrators. It, we're going to do that on behalf of this church, and we're going to help others in their own personal life because we're going to be in relation with you guys. We are going to be in small groups. We're going to be in relationship. And the third thing is this. We are going to mobilize financial resources so the kingdom of God will grow more dependent on God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit and grow in numbers of souls saved right here at First Church. I need an amen. I need an amen because this church board is held accountable to God and to you. And we mean business. We are going to be about the Father's business this next year. So I'm going to close out this section, um, and there is going to be more to come next week, and I want you to be ready to take notes next week because there are going to be practical steps on how you can be a faithful steward and what God, what's God's further design for us being managers of what already belongs to him. Everything belongs to God. Amen? Amen. Let's close out in prayer. Father God, I want to thank you for your word about finances today. And I want to thank you that you are almighty God, all powerful, and that you have made everything. I am yours. This church is yours. These people are yours. The resources that we have to manage every month are yours. We are grateful for our jobs. We are grateful for our income. We are grateful for our spouses. We are grateful for our families. We are grateful for our homes. We are grateful for our cars. We are grateful for our clothing. We are grateful for the air in our lungs, Father God. We are grateful people to you. And we recognize that you are the giver. Teach us how to be givers. Teach us to be able to give back to you what already belongs to you for the furthering of the kingdom and the expansion of the kingdom of God. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.